see quite clearly that he claims, after this um, Damascus Road event, he claims his Jewish heritage. He claims that he is still a Jew through and through, and he's a good Jew at that. Um, also, the, I think the, the biggest um, way that we can uh, correlate this as a call event and not a conversion event is that when he speaks of himself, and after the Damascus event, he speaks of himself and his call um, in Galatians 1, 13 through 16, he quotes the Isaiah and Jeremiah passages of their call to the ministry or call to what they were to do for Yahweh. Um, and so if we are going to use the word conversion uh, for Paul, we would have to use the word conversion for the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Jeremiah when they're called into a new mission, a new stage in their life um, for doing what Yahweh is calling them to do. And so um, in our interpretations of Paul, I think we should rather look or change the paradigm from a conversion into a call scenario where he is just changing um, his perspective and what he is doing for Yahweh. The next thing we've got here is justification rather than forgiveness. The word justification um, is used in Romans uh, nearly 50 times. I think it's actually more than 50 times that you've got. And the word forgiveness is only used once in all of Paul's writings. Um, the Greek word for forgiveness is all, it's in Romans 4, 7. And the reason he used it is because he couldn't, uh, he couldn't not use it because he was quoting Psalm 32, 1. And so when we think of justification, we often, often think of God is forgiving us. God has justified us. God is bringing us salvation. But in Paul's scenario here, he doesn't equate that to, uh, he doesn't equate his justification to that forgiveness. He doesn't have that correlation in his theologies. Um, what we do see, though, is he uses it to validate why a Gentile would look to a Jewish God. You know, he's, he's justifying his mission to the Gentiles and saying that the Gentiles are justified. You know, we have, we Jews have our salvation in the covenant and the Gentiles are justified into coming in to our covenant. And another uh, major point is that the justification um, is more correlated to receiving God's righteous acts. Um, and basically all that means is that if you look in Judges 5.11, which is actually what uh, scholars think is the oldest part of the Bible that we've got, um, in Judges 5.11, they talk about God justifying the people. God is coming in judgment and restoring um, those who are righteous from uh, the, these people that were coming in and destroying them. God is doing justice. God is doing righteous acts for them. And so for Paul, it's a similar way of looking at that, that God is doing these righteous acts for the Gentiles, bringing them in um, because of God's mercy. So look at, let's look at weak, weakness rather than sin. So when you're reading Romans, Paul talks a lot about weakness and his own weakness. And we oftentimes correlate that with sin. If we're weak, we're sinful. Um, but for Paul, when he's talking about weakness, he's talking about his own personal sickness that he has. Um, some people even argue, I don't know if I believe them, but they argue that Paul had epilepsy, and this prevented him from doing a lot of his mission work. And so um, when we look at uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he talks about this thorn in the side, this thorn in his flesh that keeps him from um, the mission that he, he is working towards. And um, furthermore, when he talks about sickness, we can see that sickness in and of itself 
is viewed as a weakness. So we do have that correlation where um, uh, that weakness is, is des described as be one who is being sick. And so you can see that in Galatians 4.13 and following, and then also in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. So basically what this means is for Paul, weakness comes from external forces. Paul mentions Satan as being the one that is causing his sickness. It's not any weakness of conscience or weakness within his soul, but rather it is an external force that is keeping him from his mission. It's a weakness that's coming from external places. And in fact, if you look at 2 Corinthians 13.4, um, Paul talks about uh, Christ being crucified in weakness. And so when he's talking about that, Christ wasn't crucified in sin. Christ was crucified because of external forces um, playing upon him that you've got. Now this one is usually the, the hardest one to talk about. Because like my cute little picture up there, we think of love as this cuddly, nice thing that you've got. Uh, but for Paul, the word love, the word that he's using here is agape, uh, the word love has a deep, deep theological meaning to it. And it's not just cute kittens cuddling with each other. Uh, for Paul, agape love is not an emotional response to something. But rather it's um, concern for the well-being of the church or for well-being of others that you've got. And uh, I lost my train of thought. I had an example for that. I can't think of it. All right. Anyway, so Paul also talks about how love um, and girdles, I can't believe I used that word, but it came to my head at like 3 in the morning this morning. Um, love and girdles the other spiritual gifts. It sort of reigns in. Or you can think of it if, if you've got this robe or something like that, it's a belt that pulls up the, the robe so that you don't trip on the robe. Um, it sort of reigns in these spiritual gifts. And that's a lot of what he was talking about, especially if you look at Corinthians. Um, they had all of these spiritual gifts. They were great, great um, Christians because they, they were speaking in tongues. They were prophesying. They, they had all of these great gifts. Um, but Paul is saying they didn't have love for each other. They were creating divisions between each other, saying that one gift was greater than another gift and that um, uh, there was, th there was this, this division that they had between um, the other, all the different Christians that they've got there. And so Paul says that this agape, this concern, um, and in fact agape um, in older translations, in the King James translation, is often translated as charity. Um, charity means something completely different for us now than what it meant uh, when it was translated in the, uh, King, into the King James. But it is that notion of concern uh, for the other that you've got. And also, for Paul, um, you want to love each other. You want to have this concern for each other in the unity of this church, even at the um, cost of one's integrity. So even at the cost of what you believe are essential principles of your faith, you need to sort of give that up so that the community can grow, so that love can expand and you can um, engirdle these spiritual gifts, these principles that you've got um, based on this notion of love. And so... We, after all of this, we can come up with a new perspective on what Paul was talking about. Um, and the new perspective is actually a theological term. And so if you go and do a Google search for the new perspective, there's actually a Wikipedia entry on, on it. Um, and the new perspective actually came about around the mid-80s. Um, it was developed by a gentleman named E.P. Sanders. And basically, he's a historian looking at uh, Judaism in the um, time of Paul uh, and sort of what it looked like during that time. And so if you remember from my previous slide, I talked about how we have this sort of law, gospel, antith antithesis. Um, he said 
that the Jews of the, at this time aren't the characterized um, Jews that we sort of see or interpret from the biblical text. They aren't the ones that are um, these people who you know, work on this works righteousness. They're not this legal entity that says you have to follow every um, aspect of the law to bring about salvation. But rather, what they're saying is that um, the root metaphor is the covenant. The root metaphor is that God is in relationship with the people of Israel. And from that, you can, um, from that, you can uh, have a relationship or from that springs forth the law uh, and it is the response to how you would act in a relationship with um, Yahweh. And so it's not the law that saves, but rather 